There's a couple stragglers coming in. Then we'll get going. Director of the Historical Society of Forest Park. Uh, I just wanted to tell you guys about a couple related things we're going to be doing in the near future. Uh, as always, we will be at the Haymarket Martyrs Monument on May Day from 9 to 4. I'm sure a lot of you have been there on May Day. We, will have, we won't be having a specific tour because just so many people come at different times. So we'll have information, we'll have some biographies put out. So feel free to stop by anytime from 9 to 4. And then at 1 o'clock, we'll be giving out our Mark Govin Working Class Hero Award. And then after that, we'll be dedicating a plaque to Dr. Corbin. His grave is now a National Historic Place. And we'll be dedicating the plaque to that. So we're pretty excited. Uh, if you can't make it then, and you haven't been to the Hey Market Mars Monument, or you want to do it again, or you just loved Amy so much, and you can't get enough of her, the first Saturday of the month, October through May, sorry, I knew I'd say that backwards. May through <laughs> October, yes, we only do it in the winter for some reason. May to October, we have a Haymarket Martyrs Monument and Radical Row Tour with Amy. It's 11 a.m., uh, first Saturday of the month. It's on our website if you need a reminder. Uh, it's about an hour long. She goes over the Haymarket, the people there, and then some key people around there. Um, it's a great tour. If you can't make it out again, uh, we also have it virtually on our website, which is forestparkhistory.org. Um, what else do I have? And do you need to bring your own bicycle? That is a walk. That's just a walking tour. We do have a bicycle tour, but it's not scheduled yet. That will be in the fall, in the end of summertime. So that will be on our website once we have it scheduled. Um, we will have August eighth at the library again. In this room, we'll be having a talk on Jewish Waldheim Cemetery with Amy Schmeling. So that's something we haven't done before. We're really excited about it. And lastly, we are working with the Illinois Labor History Society on the next edition of The Day Will Come. I'm sure a lot of you have that already. So we are going to be updating it. It's about 12 years old at this point. So if you know anyone who has been buried there since, there, since then, had their ashes scattered, or who isn't in the last one, let me know. Or if you go on our website, we have a form. We want to update it to include anyone else that we've missed or anyone who's been buried there since. And we hope to have that new edition out by August. So we're pretty excited about it. Uh, without further ado, I'll let Amy get started. Thanks, Alexis. Welcome. What a great crowd, and, and congratulations, because I know that uh, there was a waiting list. I know maybe they'll straggle in, but uh, who knew? And that's why um, they're filming the presentation tonight for folks that couldn't make it, so that's why we're not going to be on the nightly news, but uh, I want to thank the Forest Park, uh, of course, library and the Historical Society of Forest Park, which if you don't belong to either, please join. Uh, I'm Amy Vince Calvi. I'm a volunteer with the Historical Society. As Alexa said, I give the uh, monthly tours at the monument. Um, I've been doing that I think nine years. I can't remember. Um, I am currently a research specialist at University of Illinois Chicago. Uh, I have a background in theater which is why my voice is loud and um, my connection to the labor movement, my great-grandfather was a union organizer in the coal mines of West Virginia and as I was going through his papers I found this amazing letter when he was first organizing his uh, union in West Virginia and uh, also going through his papers I uh, deeply suspect that he was also an anarchist. Uh, but we're here to talk about Lucy Parsons. So who was Lucy? Um, Lucy is very difficult to put into a box. She's very difficult to give one definition to. Um, at one point it uh, was discussed that we were going to do this presentation during uh, Black History Month, but Lucy, even though uh, there's quite a bit of evidence that she might have been of African American descent, throughout her life she denied being of African American descent. Um, so she a lot of people want to claim her, and throughout her life she was an anarchist, a syndicalist, a radical, a communist, a socialist. She said she was Native American, Mexican, Mexican, Spanish. Many people primarily know her as a widow, a widow of one of the Haymarket martyrs, Albert Parsons. She was certainly judged by her appearance, 
Um, even her detractors uh, would comment on how uh, strikingly she was. So she was uh, described as elegant, stately, comely, beautiful, positively handsome, and then her detractors would also call her a mongrel, swarthy, illegitimate mulatto, dusky, dusky goddess of anarchy, sanguinary Amazon, which I want to claim now as my new nickname, <laughs> and, and a quadroon anarchist. So, you know, when putting this together, it's like, what angle did I want to approach this for Lucy? And I'm going to take her at her words. So she was asked by the press when they were trying to press her about her origins, her, uh, her background. She said, I'm not a candidate for office, and the public have no right to my past. I amount to nothing in, in the world, and people care nothing for me. I'm battling for a principle. So Lucy, throughout her life, was... As, as she said herself, battling for principles. So what, you know, what was her take on the world? So she fought for the working class. She fought for uh, what she called wage slaves after the uh, uh, slavery was abolished and she saw workers going to factories and working for slaves, for wages. She thought of them as wage slaves. She thought that slavery had just changed to imprisoning people, but this time by the wages they were being paid. She fought for the foreign born, the hungry, the unemployed. She cared more about movements than she did about individuals, as we'll see. And she really focused on class struggle. So that's why there's this image here. This very much fits into the philosophy of how Lucy approached uh, society. So she saw that the very bottom of the pyramid of the capitalist system, and those are all workers. And of course, they're bearing the brunt of everybody above them. And there's children included and a child that is sick or dying. And it says, we feed all at the bottom. And then directly above them is, of course, the uh, rich class. They're at an elegant uh, banquet and enjoying themselves with their finery. It says, we eat for you. And above them is the governments and the police. We shoot at you. Above them is the uh, ruling class, so either you know uh, politicians or also monarchies. We fool. Oh, I'm so sorry. Is uh, organized religion? We fool you. Above that is now the politicians and uh, you know monarchies. We rule you. But at the very top is money, capitalism. That's what all of this is based on, and it very much uh, fits into how Lucy approached her advocacy for workers' rights. She was, um, she was a powerful speaker, and she was an entertaining speaker. So she was sarcastic, off the cuff. She used very vibrant imagery in her speeches. She was a prolific writer. And as I talk, spoke before, she's a life full of contradictions, as we'll see. Um, it's great to look at some of the publications that she wrote for. It sort of like encapsulates her philosophy. So she wrote articles for The Socialist, The Alarm, and The Alarm was an anarchist newspaper. Uh, labor Inquirer, The Demonstrator, The Agitator, The Industrial Worker, The Labor Defender, and One Big Union Monthly. She was an author of a biography of her husband, Albert Parsons. And then she was also the editor of a newspaper, Freedom, a revolutionary anarchist communist monthly, The Liberator, and the famous speeches of the Chicago Martyrs. So before we launch into the timeline of Lucy's life, I wanted to point out some of her uh, quotes, these amazing quotes. So uh, early in her speaking career, especially when she was um, out trying to raise money for the Haymarket, uh, the men that were accused for the bombing at the Haymarket, she would start her speeches by saying, I'm an anarchist. I suppose you came here, most of you, to see what a real live anarchist looked like. I suppose some of you expected to see me with a bomb in one hand and a flaming torch in the other, but are disappointed in seeing neither. Um, this uh, other quote, uh, let every dirty, lousy tramp arm himself with a revolver or a knife and lay in wait on the steps of the palaces of the rich and stab or shoot the owners as they come out. Let us kill them without mercy. Let there be a war of extermination. So this sets the tone of <laughs> Lucy doesn't pull any punches. She's not shy. She's not retiring. She comes out uh, literally guns blazing. Uh, my other two uh, favorite quotes, never be deceived that the rich will allow you to vote away their wealth. Uh, which rings true now. And then I, I apologize for the format here. I love this quote. The reinvention of daily life means marching off the end of our maps. And it's interesting that the, the typeface went off of the map as well. Um, like I said, it's very difficult to be exactly precise with the origins of Lucy's life. Um, uh, we do know that she went by several names. So the first names that she used, Lucia, Ella, and Lucy. She used different middle names, Ella and Eldine, and she used several last names, Carter, Diaz, Delgather, Gonzalez, Hull, Hall, Waller, and Parsons. Um, 
we believe there is evidence that Lucy uh, that was, was born into slavery. We don't know the year. Uh, could be June 1848, as early as that, or as late as March 1853. Um, it's also... Um, not definite where she was born. Could have been Virginia, could have been Texas. But what we do know, and I'm gonna, um, there was a, a recent biography that came out in 2017, and I'm using a lot of those, the information from that biography for this presentation. In 1863, there was a man who uh, was a slave owner, Thomas Taliaferro, and he moved his, uh, he moved all of his, himself and, and the slaves that he owned to, from Virginia to Texas. <coughs> And a lot of slave owners did this at the time because the Confederacy would come and uh, confiscate slaves from owners to uh, send to the war. And so they, they weren't doing that in Texas, so a lot of these slave owners moved west. Um, a lot listed among those that moved with him was a 12-year-old girl by the name of Lucia. Uh, she was uh, of mixed race, and her father was rumored to either be, uh, Tia, and I'm, gonna, I'm butchering this name, even when I was practicing at home, uh, Tiago Ferro or another white man. Uh, around the same time, in 1865, Albert Parsons, who later marries Lucy, uh, he ha was fighting for the Confederacy. And when the Civil War ended, he came to Texas to go to Waco University. And at, when he's in Texas, he starts to see just how unfair life is for African Americans and freed uh, people. And he does a 180, and he becomes a radical Republican and works for the rights of African Americans. Um, after the Civil War, freed people in Texas, their lives are still very much endangered. Texas still has what are called black codes, and they could come and grab you and you had to involuntarily uh, be apprenticed to whoever they decided. The uh, local officials could seize uh, black children and put them to work for white people. There were roving bands of uh, terrorists, the KKK, the Gavings Gang, gang families of the South, Knights of the Rising Sun, fishbackers lynchings, ter terrible violence against African Americans. So at this time, Lucia, now that she is a freed person, she moves her family to Waco, which is a larger town, and she's hoping that it'll be safer for them. In 1866, Texas refuses to ratify the 13th and 14th Amendments, and there's actually an act to define and declare the rights of persons lately known as slaves and free persons of color, and it requires that African Americans have to work in the fields, they're barred from recovering wages if somebody uh, doesn't pay them. And there's harsh, harsh punishments for vagrants. So if somebody is out and about and you're not working under direct white supervision, there's hard, harsh um, punishment. So you can imagine it's not a welcoming environment for people of color. In uh, 1868, Lucia's mother marries a man named Carter. And on her uh, marriage license, she lists her maiden name as Charlotte Tielaferro. That's the last time I have to pronounce that. Um, and of course, that was a common uh, custom at the time that people that were enslaved would take the last name of the person that had owned them. Charlotte and her children then take the last name of Carter. Lucia works as odd jobs as a cook and a seamstress. And she also meets Oliver Gathings, uh, who later changes his name to Benton. He is also a former slave. He claims that they were married, that they married, became married, and then he sends her to a school, which is really uh, pretty progressive at the time. Um, and you had to pay to go to school. So he sends Lucy to school. He thinks that she's very clever and smart and she deserves an education. The school is run by a northern white man, uh, David Davis, who was later also rumored to have had a relationship with Lucia. Lucia around this time becomes pregnant. In 1869, she meets Albert Parsons. So again, Albert Parsons is uh, advocating for free people's rights and, and trying to get uh, people registered to vote, and, uh, but they be start a relationship. And it's very difficult for them to play, find places to meet. And Albert has a friend who runs a, an establishment by the last name of Champ, C-H-A-M-P-E. So Lucy has her baby around this time, and she names the baby Champ. Whether it's named after Albert's friend, we don't know, it's just speculation. That baby later dies. There isn't any um, recording of when or how this baby dies. But in 1872, Albert and Lucia marry. There is a marriage license that's issued in McLennan County, but it's possible that they was, the marriage actually took place in a different county. Um, it's not signed by the officiant, uh, but on that marriage uh, license, Lucia gives her name as Ella Hall. And you would think in Texas that for a woman of color and a white uh, man to get married uh, wasn't legal. There was a brief window of time in Texas when interracial marriages were legal, 
Um, there was a Texas Supreme Court decision, Honey versus Clark, and, they, and this marriage might have happened in that little window. But Albert, uh, he now is starting to be threatened with violence as well because he's advocating for the rights of freedmen and women, and it's difficult for an interracial couple in Texas at that time, so they decide to move to Chicago. This is about the time that Lucy changes her Lucia, if, if we believe that this is Lucia, that her name is changed to Lucy. They live at the area of Larrabee and North Avenue, which is primarily a, ger a German immigrant area. Um, I, for a lot of these locations in Chicago, I, I did a little day trip and drove around. Of course, there's very little still in these neighborhoods that would have been there when they were living there. Uh, Lucy works as a seamstress, and they both join the Social Democratic Party of North America. To show you, and I hope it's okay if I swear, what a badass Lucy is. So she's definitely a woman of color. You know, she's just in uh, Chicago not very long, and there's records of her taking two white people to court. So one of them was over an unpaid bill, we're guessing it was from her seamstress uh, business, and one was over a uh, disturbance, and she was accusing a neighbor of running a house of prostitution. So, like, good for Lucy, <laughs> she goes to the court. Uh, in 1876, both Lucy and Albert become uh, involved in the Working Men's Party of the United States, which was later changed to the Socialist Labor Party, the SLP. and um, Throughout the rest of this, and this, and this period of time, a lot of these organizations, um, they change names, they have fights within, each, uh, there's fractions within each of these groups. It's very difficult to follow all of these groups um, without my notes, so I will do my best. <laughs> and uh, you can always correct me. Um, in 1877, there is a railroad strike in uh, Chicago. And Lucy says that this is her, her moment that she becomes interested in the labor movement. And in fact, you'll see her quote, it was during the great railroad strike of 1877 that I first became interested in what is known as the labor question. So uh, the workers are getting organized, they're striking against the railroad, and then Lucy watches as um, the police and the government sides with the capitalists and they trample the workers. And this is a pattern that Lucy's gonna see over and over again. Um, so because of this, she starts to believe that change is only possible through militant actions. So she's watching these unarmed workers, these downtrodden people, and the police have batons and guns and strength in numbers, and so it's basically that the working people don't have a chance unless they start to arm themselves. She writes a letter to the editor of The Socialist, harmony of the employer and the employed or basically master and slave, is as unlikely as harmony between the robber and the robbed. She starts lecturing. Um, Albert, had, during this railroad strike, Albert was giving speeches to uh, encourage the workers to remain on strike and to get more people to uh, advocate for their rights. And he's a very, he also in his own right is a very powerful speaker, very influential, very charismatic. Um, he is fired from his job as a typesetter for a new, uh, Chicago mag uh, newspaper and in fact is physically threatened. He's pulled from the street, he's threatened with violence, he's told to leave Chicago. So he's basically blacklisted from his job uh, as um, in the printing business. So he, Lucy starts a company herself, Parsons and Company, and Albert is a partner in that company. Um, Lucy, with her friend Lucy Swank, who later becomes Lucy Swank Holmes, start the Chicago Working Women's Union. So, even though this is a union for women, Lucy didn't um, specifically advocate for women's rights, and in fact was very much against uh, women's suffragette movement, um, mostly because she didn't believe in voting. But it's she's again, um, you know, um, it's it's hard to put her in the box. So she is advocating for women, but she sees them more as a working class as opposed to gender politics, as we would think about it now. So this union was meant to bring women, especially servants, and um, into the cause for socialism. They, uh, like I said, she worked with Lizzie Swank, they become lifelong friends. Um, again, they largely ignored, they did not go out and specifically uh, advocate for black women to join this union. And at this time, labor unions, um, it was a difficult relationship. They did not, they had an uneasy relationship with black workers, women, and children because they were seen as strike breakers. So a lot of times owners would bring in uh, those workers because they would come in for lower wages. Um, Lucy, at this time, as she's advocating for people to join the Socialist Party, she appears in public pregnant, which is scandalous at this time. 
She, Albert runs for office. He's running as a socialist. Um, he was getting some degree of success, but kept losing these elections. And Lucy believed that the ballot box was being stuffed and that people were cheating to keep him out of office. And so very soon, um, they become disenfranchised with the electoral process. And you can see here's Lucy's quote about uh, being interested in the labor movement. And as Albert is running for office, she sews his campaign. We, we, she helps with the campaigns. We think she sews banners. And then I just have some examples of banners of the time. Um, these are not from Albert's uh, 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 campaigns, but these are the kind of banners that you would see at events. And this is from a protest that took place around uh, Thanksgiving. So you can see here's why, why we think, because our capitalist Christian brothers are happily enjoying our turkeys, our wines, and our houses. And shall we thank our lords for our misery, destitution, and poverty? And then on the right, it's super hard to read, but you'll see this uh, slogan used over and over again, our civilization, colon, the Bullet and Policeman's Club. So again, the workers, their experience of policemen is just, are just being shot at and beaten. Here's a couple of more posters of that time, or banners at that time. Uh, the, the one on your left is from a German uh, furniture company, and, or union, and then the one on the right, uh, a lot of the workers also very much admired the revolution in France. So liberty, equality, and fraternity. Um, and it's significant that it's the color red. So red is a socialist color, as an anarchist color, as a communist color, is meant to represent uh, red blood, that all of us have red blood, and it's a movement for everyone. In 1879, uh, Lucy and Albert have a son, Albert Jr. On his birth certificate, he's listed as Negro. Um, on that birth certificate, Lucy gives her maiden name as Carter and Virginia as her birthplace. So that leads a little credence to the uh, belief that she was born into slavery in Virginia. Uh, Lucy and Albert, like I said, they become disillusioned with voting and they start to believe in consensus for uh, civilization as it moves forward. Um, they speak at what are called monster picnics and parades. So the workers at that time, the only day off of the week they would have would be Sunday. And so they had these big gatherings on Sundays, these big picnics, and Lucy and Albert would advocate for people to join the Socialist Party to become uh, to start to advocate for their rights. And you can see the, uh, it's hard to see the illustration, but it shows people at a picnic, and then you can see a man on a, a box talking to people, and then at the bottom that is meant to be Lucy talking to these crowds. Um, and then you'll see that people are raising beer glasses. So the establishments um, mocked these uh, events, and they were scandalized that people were drinking on Sunday, the Lord's Day, but of course, ignoring the fact that that was the only day off that these uh, workers had, and of course they're gonna drink beer on their day off. In 1880, Lucy's uh, Working Women's Union collapses. There could be many reasons. A lot of women were simply overwhelmed. Not only did they not have time to organize uh, for their rights, but they were probably also taking care of their households. Um, and then some women at that time, it was an embarrassment to have a job. And so they wanted to pretend that they didn't have to work and that they were better off. In 1881, Lulu, their second child, is born. Uh, on her birth certificate, she's listed as N-I-G-E-R, which we can um, imagine what that's a typo of. Lucy gives her maiden name on that as Lucy Ella Hull, and Virginia, again, as her birthplace. Um, around this time, Albert founds the American group of the anarchist uh, organization, International Working People's Association, the IWPA. And so at this time, people that are advocating for rights, they're called many names that are almost interchangeable. So sometimes, uh, like, they would use the word communist the way we would use the word radical. So Albert actually addresses this. He says, we're called by some communists or socialists or anarchists. We accept all three of the terms. Albert publishes The Alarm, which is the newspaper press of the IWPA. And in the very first edition, on the very first page, is an article that Lucy writes to tramps. And tramps, before the late 1870s, when you tramped, it just meant you were hiking, you were walking. But it became a derogatory term for people that were out of work, because they were tramping from place to place looking for work or for help. So she writes this article to tramps, the unemployed, the disinherited, and the miserable. So this really solidifies Lucy as an important figure. This is a very um, important article that comes out. Um, it's later printed as a pamphlet and sells over 100,000 copies, and it's really a call to arms. And in fact, the very last line of the article is, learn the use of explosives. So again, Lucy is not, she's not shy. 
Other articles that she wrote for The Alarm, The Factory Child, Their Wrongs Portrayed and Their Rescue Demanded. This is a very telling article, The Negro. Let him leave politics and the politician to let, let, let him leave politics to the politician and prayers to the preacher. So again, she's sort of, and we can understand if she's a woman of color, she might want to distance herself from her actual heritage if that is in fact her actual heritage. And again, she's looking at it as, as a class warfare. So what's going to get them best to workers' rights? Right now, she's uh, advocating that Negro workers take a back seat while they get the rights that they deserve. And then she also writes an article, Dynamite, the only voice the oppressors of the people can understand. So you can tell that her writing is meant to not only to shock the powers that be, but to also to wake up workers. She's really, she and Albert are really hoping that uh, workers united and fired up can overthrow capitalism and make it a better world. The mainstream press loves them. They're, they make great copy. Um, they, both the police and the press infiltrate the meetings to organize workers, um, but they're very clumsy in their undercover outfits and quite are very easily identified at some of these meetings. And in fact, we suspect sometimes that they played around with them, so maybe some of the more, more shocking quotes that we see could have been them sort of just playing around with them. Um, Lucy says that anarchists aren't actually bloodthirsty, but are aiming for a new free society flowing from the good judgment of people and not governments. So they very much believe that if people are left to their own devices, without an organized government, without organized religion, that they will naturally form co cooperative groups, and that was much better than what we have now. In 1885, there's a great upheaval. There's a lot of labor ferment because of depression. And I'm sure we all know this, the, uh, the economy in the 1800s was like a roller coaster. It, you would have desperate depressions over and over again, bank collapses over and over again. But in 1885, there's a lot of labor ferment, and um, Chicago's opening a brand new uh, Board of Trade, which Lucy refers to as the Board of Thieves. And she and, Luce, she and Lizzie lead a march of the I, IWPA to the Board of Trade as a protest. And they were having, it's almost like that uh, illustration we saw earlier, they're having a big fancy banquet with people in fancy gowns. And they wanted to march the workers, the, the people that are suffering, to this event. Um, she's still speaking to crowds of to 500 to 1,000 people, advocating. And at this time, uh, Mother Jones, who is also a very famous uh, labor organizer, uh, she comments that she's not crazy about the approach that Lucy takes. She thinks that the rhetoric is too violent and it's going to turn people off to the progress that they can make. Um, I, there is, you can see here is a poster or a flyer for one of those uh, mass meetings, um, and it has Albert Parsons' name on it. Um, then in 1886, the uh, organized trade and labor unions call for a strike on May 1st, 1886 for an eight hour workday. And this is gonna set uh, events um, that lead to the hay market. So in 1886, on May 1st, so this is, this is the, the, you know, when I give the tour at the hay market, you know, this will take an hour. So I'm gonna try really hard to condense this. Um, so on May 1st, there's a general strike called for an eight hour work day. It's very successful, it's very peaceful. Um, as it continues to go, more and more people are walking off their jobs and Chicago is very much an epicenter for this. Um, there is a, uh, Albert, uh, I'm sorry, August Spees is giving a speech at the, um, uh, uh, on the south side um, where there's a strike going on at the McCormick Reaper plant. And he watches as armed police officers uh, shoot into the crowd of unarmed strikers and kill people, unarmed strikers. So they call for a meeting to be held at the Haymarket in Chicago on May 4th. Um, Lucy and Albert come. Albert is pulled in as a very last minute speaker. He was meant to be at another event. So Lucy and their children come to the Haymarket for, and Albert gives a speech. Um, it's debated whether or not the children were actually with them at the Haymarket. There are witnesses that saw them before and witnesses that saw them after, but nobody mentions them at the actual Haymarket. But throughout the, uh, the trial that follows this, uh, Lucy and Albert emphasize, why would we have gone somewhere if we knew there was going to be a bomb and bring our children? So Lucy and the children watch as Albert gives his speech. The uh, night turns cold. They leave the event before it's over. They go to a nearby beer hall. And um, while that is happening, uh, 176 armed police officers come down the street and demand that the uh, events at the Haymarket break up. 
there's some pushback. There's, this is a peaceful meeting. We're not breaking any laws, but the police say you have to disband, and somebody throws a bomb. To this day, we don't know who threw that bomb. We can say with almost 100% accuracy that none of the men that were later uh, accused of throwing the bomb threw the bomb. But Lucy and Albert are in the beer hall when the bomb is thrown. And when they hear that what has happened, Lucy tells Albert that he needs to flee because she knows that he's going to be targeted. And sure enough, the next day, the police go and they round up all the usual suspects. They go into houses without warrants. They uh, seize the press. They start denying people the right to free speech. Uh, Lucy is arrested. Um, she's arrested but then released because they hope that she's going to lead him to Albert, which of course she doesn't. She's arrested and released several times while all this is going on. They end up uh, accusing eight men, taking eight men to trial for this uh, bomb throwing and accuse them with conspiracy to murder, even though they still don't know who threw the bomb. And on the very first day of the trial, Albert very dramatically walks into the courtroom. He says, I'm so uh, convinced of my innocence and you will find me innocent that I want to be here with my comrades. Lucy, uh, I did pretty good. Usually that takes an hour. <laughs> um, so uh, Lucy comes to court every day. And they again, they comment on her appearance extensively in the press, how beautifully she's dressed. What is, what is she wearing in her hair? How does she have her hair done? Um, but, and as the police become more and more, uh, the press becomes more and more interested in Lucy, they become curious in her roots. So they go to Texas and they start to interview people in Waco that they think knew uh, Lucy and they show them uh, pictures of her and sure enough, Oliver Benton says, yep, that's my wife, that's, that's who I married. So they come back and they confront Lucy and Albert with this. Albert laughs and he says, well, I did sleep with Oliver Benton's wife, but that was a different woman. And I met Lucy at a ranch in another part of Texas. And she's, you know, Native American and Mexican and, you know, and they laughed it off. Um, the eight men are found guilty. Immediately after the guilty plea starts, Lucy starts to advocate for money for uh, an appeal. And she takes to the road, and she travels extensively. She goes to um, over 16 states, probably speaks to over 200,000 people. And again, how <laughs> crazy brave of her as a woman of color traveling on her own all across the United States. Um, she's very famously arrested in Columbus, Ohio, and thrown into jail, which makes national headlines. And uh, unfortunately, at this time, the Knights of Labor, uh, they start to become a little bit more conservative in their approach, and they try to give themselves some distance from these anarchists, and particularly Lucy. Um, and so you can see here, um, up in the corner is a uh, poster that was used for the eight-hour uh, movement, eight hours to work, eight hours for rest, eight hours for what we will. And then here is a, um, an advertisement for Lucy speaking, the wife of the condemned anarchist you know, will deliver a free speech, and I love at the bottom, everybody should avail themselves of this opportunity to hear the most talented and eloquent woman of the age. Uh, uh, here is an illustration from the newspaper of Lulu uh, visiting Albert in prison and Lucy outside. And what they did is they had all of the accused in sort of this cage area, and people could be on the perimeter. And so the press was always on the outside trying to eavesdrop on the visits with the family and the condemned. So on, um, the, they were able to get an appeal to the Illinois Supreme Court that upheld the verdicts. They tried to get the case to go to the uh, United States Supreme Court, which refused to hear the case. So um, a one man, Oscar uh, Neve, was, his sentence was 15 years hard labor. Two other men, uh, Michael Schwab and Samuel Fielden, wrote to the governor for clemency and they had their uh, sentences commuted to life in prison. So five men were condemned to be hanged. The night before the hanging, Louis Ling, who was admittedly a bomb maker, whenever proven that it was his bomb at the Haymarket, he was not physically at the Haymarket, but he's found in uh, his cell with half his face blown off from a blasting cap. It could have either been suicide to rob the hangman of his victory, or, the, uh, or maybe the police helped him along, we don't know. But four men are condemned to be hanged among them, Albert Parsons. On the day of the hanging, Lucy had been told that she and the children could visit Albert one more time. Um, she shows up at the courthouse and they play games with her. They say, Lucy, you can go in this door, and then they won't let her in that door. So then she walks to the other side of the building. No, Lucy, you can't go in this door. You have to go in the other door. Finally, she becomes so frustrated, she tries to break through the police line. They immediately arrest her. They take her and the children to the jail where they're strip searched. 
Um, there are some reports that she was kept in the cell naked while they're waiting to hear news about Albert. So after Albert is hanged, um, the casket is brought to their shop. Over 10,000 people come to visit Albert's body. Lucy places the red flag that she had flown on the march to the Board of Trade um, on Albert and his casket. Um, on the time when it's so the only cemetery, and this is our big connection to Forest Park, the only cemetery that will accept the bodies of the Haymarket Martyrs is here in Forest Park. At the time it was called Waldheim. It's now called Forest Home, which is uh, German, in German, Forest Home is Waldheim. There is a procession, it goes through Chicago. The procession, the funeral procession picks up each of the uh, dead men at their home and then continues down. Thousands of people line the street. The mayor of Chicago says they cannot play protest music and they cannot have the kind of protest banners we saw before. So people show up in red. They're wearing red or they bring red flowers. There's one red flag that is flown at the head of the procession without any words on it. And because they can't play protest music, they're playing dirges. So it sort of backfires on the mayor in that this whole funeral procession is even more important and more solemn because of these uh, uh, restrictions. Um, so the funeral procession, over 6,000 people join the procession. Lucy walks behind the casket. They had to have a, a special train from Chicago to Forest Park uh, to accommodate the 3,000 people that come out on the special trains. So up top, you can see that's the illustration. It's, I know it's hard to see, um, but that's the, the funeral procession through Chicago. And at the top are illustrations of the homes of the condemned. And then at the bottom, when the bodies first came to Forest Park, um, they were kept in a temporary mausoleum until they were moved to their final resting place. Uh, and that was obviously before the monument was built. After the death, Lucy takes to the world road again, and she immediately starts to campaign to enshrine their memories. And she again, she's thinking that now that there's martyrs for the cause, this is finally going to inspire the workers to overthrow capitalism. Uh, she's seen driving around, driving around Chicago with a cart with banners on the side, um, and on one side are the words, when the men were hanged, Albert Parsons uh, tried to speak. He was like, will you let me speak? Will you let the voice of the people be heard? And they pull the lever, and he is hanged before he's able to finish his speech. So she has it printed on the side, of, on a banner, on the cart that she's driving around town. town. And she falls on uh, tough times. After the men are hanged, an organization is founded, the Pioneer AIDS uh, Survivors Fund is started, and that is meant to support the widows and the families of the hanged men after their deaths. Uh, in 1888, she is uh, invited to come to uh, Britain to give a speech. Lucy is thrilled at the trip. She feels uh, much more of a sense of freedom to be able to speak more freely, which is ironic to her that she doesn't feel that same sense of uh, free speech in America. Um, but she does clash with Annie Besant. If you, uh, you know, she was um, important for the Match Girls strike, which was a uh, very successful strike in Britain. And she clashes with Lucy over Lucy's uh, advocacy of violence again. So she's a very, still very controversial. In 1889, Lucy meets Martin Locker, who moves in with her. And this is scandalous at the time. He's younger than Lucy, and he's married with a family. Um, and some uh, anarchists are a little bit shocked because they feel like Lucy is not being respectful to Albert's memory by already having a relationship with another man. It's a very tumultuous relationship. Uh, when it breaks up, they actually end up in court. Uh, Lucy takes him to court, saying that he broke up her furniture with an ax. Uh, he admits to breaking up the furniture, but said, I bought it, so it was my property. <laughs> and, and of course, the court sides with him because, you know, men. Sorry, guys. <laughs> and together, they published the book, uh, The Life of Albert Parsons, which Lucy uh, sells uh, for the rest of her life. Um, she sells copies of the book and the speeches, and uh, she becomes a, a Chicago institution at this time. People travel to come see Lucy standing on corners selling this literature. Um, and at the time, some people actually questioned some of her uh, motives. Uh, you know, is it to, for, you know, to enshrine your memory, or is it money-making for her? Which you can't blame her. She doesn't have a lot of money. Um, in October of that year, uh, Lulu dies of lymphedemia, which is a swelling of the lymph glands. Uh, before that, she had been ill with scarlet fever, so perhaps that led to this. And there isn't a lot written about Lucy's relationship with her children. Um, we do know, you know, when she was on the road, she was on the road quite a bit, and so her children stayed with friends. 
And there are reports of a couple times of Albert Jr. Uh, running away from home. At one point he ran away home, from home a couple of days, another time he was gone a couple of weeks. Um, and Lucy very publicly tells the press that she's raising Albert Jr. to be an anarchist and she wants him to follow in the footsteps of her husband. Um, in 1890 and 1891, Lucy is hounded by the press and the police corps. Force. So this is a pattern that we see over and over again that happens with Lucy. She is scheduled to give a speech, she books a hall, the police find out about it, they go and they talk to the owners of the hall, they say you can't let Lucy in. Lucy shows up, they bar her access to the hall, and then so Lucy won't be deterred, so she takes a chair or a box and she stands in the middle of the street to give her speech and she's promptly arrested. Um, it, I tried to keep track of the number of times it was mentioned that Lucy was arrested and I, and I had to stop. It was too frustrating. Um, she's also harassed for flying the red flag of anarchism and she's made to fly the American flag. But she's an unrepentant anarchist even at the time that people start to move to more progressive reforms. So at the time people are moving away from um, the anarchist rhetoric of destroying the system and being like, okay, how can we work within the system? How can we change laws? How can we get something at, like a uh, labor bureau uh, statistics, which was revolutionary at the time. But Lucy, again, she's still focusing on the class struggle of the workers and the capitalists. And then here's a quote, and so here's the illustration of Lucy being taken off in a police wagon. Um, and this is a great quote from her at the time. We cannot help but believe that were every law, every title deed, every court, and every police officer or soldier abolished tomorrow with one sweep, we would be better off than we are now. You can't really blame her. Um, there, is she, um, there starts to be rivalry with other organizers as she advocates for syndicalism and she's out of step with other women radicals. Um, Jane Addams is starting to start her settlement house movement for Hull House. And again, uh, other radicals want to work maybe a little bit more in the system, and so they think that Lucy, again, is sort of detracting by, uh, by a lot of her rhetoric. She cannot find a philosophical home among these progressives. She builds a house at 999 Hammond, which later became North Troy, which I tried to drive to, which is now under the Kennedy. Um, and then uh, she has sort of a prickly relationship with the Pioneer Aid Society. And at this point, they start to complain to Lucy because she's uh, collecting funds as though she has two children, but Lulu, of course, has uh, died. Um, in 1892, with Lizzie Swank, she founds the newspaper Freedom, a revolutionary anarchist communist monthly. Um, and at the same time, if anybody came to the Emma Goldman uh, discussion last year, well, you'll remember when Alexander Berkman tried to assassinate Henry Frick um, during the Homestead strike in the hopes of spurring uh, a workers' revolution. And Lucy hears about this and she praises him. She says, good, that's what we need. We need, to, we need to wake everybody up. We need a propaganda of the deed. We need something to happen as a spark. And then she starts to do antics at events. So because she's sort of fallen out of favor with some of the newer movements, there's sometimes where they have events and Lucy is not invited. So Lucy shows up and she sits in the back of the, of the auditorium and she waits for an opportune moment and she walks to the front and because she is such a moving speaker and, and she is popular with workers, people cheer. Here's Lucy Parsons, the you know, Haymarket widow and she's here and she gets to the front and she sort of takes over the meeting. So you can imagine some of these uh, organizers were not always so pleased to see Lucy in the crowd. In 1894 is the Pullman strike in Chicago and uh, Lucy sees the, the, the strength of United Workers and gets inspired but again watches as the U.S. government throttles the, uh, the strike. They send in, the U.S. government sends in uh, the army to break up the strike. So again, she's seeing that pattern. Um, in 1896, her house burns down uh, but that doesn't stop her from selling literature. She's selling fire damaged copies of her books. In 1897, she becomes interested in the works of the Social Democracy of America, and uh, she meets Emma Goldman. Um, she objects, again, poor Lucy cannot find a philosophical home. She's probably kind of of a different age. So Emma Goldman very famously takes the idea of anarchism to mean complete individual freedom, including sexual liberation. You could sleep with whoever you want to, whenever you want to, however many you want to, and Lucy is scandalized. She does not like this. And Lucy is, again, a contradiction. 
Um, she thinks that monogamy is the basis of a sound uh, society, that if you have free sex, children don't know who their fathers are, which is ironic seeing that Lucy had had an extramarital um, affair. And uh, Emma thinks that Lucy is riding on Albert's coattails. She thinks that she's just using Albert's fame because she so, was so inspired by the Haymarket Martyrs that she thinks that Lucy is just trying to tag along. And then Lucy accuses Emma of catering to the upper class, because Emma would give speeches not just to workers, but also to capitalists. In 1899, Lucy uh, protests young men enlisting to fight in the Philippines during the Spanish-American War. So she's, she sees it as a power grab for capitalists again, colonialism, and so she's very adamant about people not go, enlisting. But Albert, who is nine, Albert Jr., who is 19, sign, wants to sign up. He wants to enlist in the Army. So Lucy takes him to court. And again, here we go again with these contradictions. She, um, you know, she doesn't believe in you know, the government, but goes to the courts to get Albert Jr. declared insane. And because he's not 21, it's sort of a property rights. And so um, during the trial, Albert Jr.'s friends show up and say he's not insane, but the judge sides with Lucy and he's uh, committed to the Elgin Asylum for the Insane, which lo later becomes a Northern Illinois hospital and asylum. He's examined when he gets there. The doctor says he looks healthy to me, but he's still uh, uh, committed. He is treated poor, reportedly he's treated poorly because of the infamy of his parents. And he lives there until he dies in 1919 of tuberculosis at the age of 40. And reportedly, Lucy never goes to visit him. In 1905, she joins uh, Big Bill Haywood, Mother Jones, and Eugene Debs to found the Industrial Workers of the World. So this is, uh, the Industrial Workers of the World is meant to be a union for everyone. So a lot of unions are sort of siloed to their uh, occupation. So you would have like the Lumber Shovers Union or um, you know, the Textile Workers Union. But this is meant to be a uh, union for all. Uh, it's open to all races. Lucy didn't organize workers for long. Some in the IWW uh, still were prickly with Lucy and she was actually referred to as an anarchist freak. Um, but she is the only woman that speaks at the opening of the convention. And during that speech, she does advocate for women to get involved and uh, for the rights of women. Uh, she becomes an editor of the Liberator, which is the IWW paper. And then here she is, she advocates for the rights of women to divorce, have property, and when to have children. In 1907, the market crashes, and Lucy and the IWW are on an unemployment committee, which the government refuses to acknowledge. And here's a couple of quotes from Lucy's speech at the, uh, that first convention of the IWW. Um, I hope even now to live to see the day when the first dawn of the new era of labor will have arisen and capitalism will be a thing of a past. So she is unwavering. Um, and then the definition of what a strike is is changing. So it used to be you would strike and you would walk out and you would uh, be outside of the factory. And she's saying, no, strike and remain in. Take possession of the property of production. In 1910, George Mark still moves in with Lucy, and they also have a relationship. He's also a radical. Newspapers refer to him as, his, as her husband, but I don't believe that they ever officially got married. In 1911, she's advocating for a five-hour workday, which I would also advocate for. <laughs> in uh, 1915, the AFL, Socialist Party, and Jane Addams Hull House is, have a march for um, work and relief. And Lucy comes and she gives a speech. And she gives a very fiery speech, and she gets everybody worked out, and it turns into a melee. And there is a big fight with as many as 1,500 people fighting with the police outside of Hull House. Uh, many are arrested, including Lucy. That is her uh, bug shot there. And you can see the newspaper article at the time. It's hard to see, but uh, there's a photo of the women that are arrested. And um, you can see that the, there's an illustration. It's meant to show that they're protesting. They're asking for bread. And there's a mounted police officer with a billy club raised to beat them. Um, Jane Addams pays Lucy's bail, which shocked people at the time. Um, but I think that she thought Lucy's heart was in the right place for this particular uh, uh, demonstration. And here's another quote from Lucy. Again, she's, not, she's unwavering. You are not absolutely defenseless. For the torch of the incendiary, which has been known with impunity, cannot be wrested from you. So she's still advocating for people to burn the house down. In 1917, with the Russian Revolution, Lucy starts to move towards communism because she starts, she's getting hope that this is finally, finally the workers taking over. 
Um, and she fears that anarchism, as she knows it, is, is done in the United States. In uh, 1918 and 1920, there are the Palmer Raids, and that is when the United States government goes and raids IWW offices and other radicals, and they round up a bunch of radicals, including Emma Goldman, and they deport them under the new Anarchist Exclusion Act. And Lucy starts to work with the Communist International Labor Defense, uh, and that is an organization that raised funds and resources for people that were unjustly imprisoned for their work for the workers. In the 1930s, she gives a speech at a May Day event at the Ashland Auditorium, and the speech, again, is so controversial that it's actually reprinted in the hearings before a special committee to investigate communist activities in the United States. Then she starts to advocate for the re release of Thomas Mooney. So Thomas Mooney was a man who was falsely accused of throwing a bomb in San Francisco at a demonstration against World War I. And she also starts to advocate for the defense of Angelo Herndon and the Scottsboro Eight, and those were eight African-American gentlemen that were falsely accused of uh, raping two white women. And here is an amazing photograph that uh, I found at the Chicago uh, History Museum. And uh, I have never seen another photo of Lucy at the Haymarket Monument, which is here in Forest Park. So here's Lucy, and she's uh, laying a wreath at the monument. And, um, on the far left, that is the mother of one of the uh, Scottsboro Eight, and then with the cloche hat, that is Lucy, and then on uh, the far right, that is Thomas Mooney's mother. So I would love if we could somehow find a better copy of this picture. Uh, in the 1930s, she becomes friends with Ben Reitman, and again, those of you who know about Emma Goldman, Ben Reitman is a very famously a lover of Emma Goldman's, so maybe again, this is another wedge between Lucy and uh, Emma Goldman. Uh, ben Reitman was known as uh, the, um, the king of the hobos. Um, he was an MD and he was also, um, you know, uh, the doctor that attended to a lot of prostitutes. Uh, and then he very famously started the hobo colleges, which there was one here in Chicago. And he would quite often drive Lucy and George Marstall out to Forest Park to visit the monument. In the 1930s, she's in ill health. She has pleurisy. She starts to lose her sight. Uh, she continues to live on Troy. She um, fixed up that house, but she's in, in poverty. Um, she's still selling pamphlets, and uh, she would make the six to seven mile journey walking into the loop, selling these pamphlets and books. Uh, she became a familiar, uh, familiar uh, figure at Bughouse Square. Bughouse Square is a park outside of Newberry Library where a lot of radicals would give speeches. And also the Dill Pickle Club, which I so wish this was still there, was a, a little club where a lot of bohemians, uh, radicals, writers, um, artists would go to the Dill Pickle Club. Um, at this point, people know that she has a library of around 3,000 books at her home on Troy. And she repairs her relationship with Nina Spees. So Nina Van, Van Spees was another Haymarket widow. Uh, her story is really interesting. She was a socialite that uh, we fell in love with one of the Haymarket's uh, martyrs, um, August Spees, and she ends up marrying him while he's in jail uh, during the Haymarket affair. And she's disowned by her rich family. And so when it comes time every year to commemorate the events of the Haymarket, because they're uh, the widows, Nina and Lucy sort of battle over who gets the seat of honor, like who gets the first seat behind whatever's happening or who gets top billing. So they came to an, a, a, to a, an agreement that they would split it every other year. Um, but in the 1930s, they patch it up between the two of them. And you can see here up at the top that it's um, an advertisement for commemorating the Haymarket riot, and it's organized by uh, Ben Reitman, and that year Lucy got top billing. So she is top billing over Nina. In 1939, she, becomes a, she officially becomes a communist. And um, this is another wedge between her and Emma Goldman. So during the Russian Revolution, the communists very famously um, slaughtered a bunch of anarchists. There was a, 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 an, an enclave of anarchists in Russia, and it was, it was pretty darn brutal. And that was what drove Emma Goldman out of the Communist Party. She could now no longer be a communist. Lucy uh, looks the other way. And when they asked her about it, she said, well, it's war. What did they expect? Um, so Goldman, at this time, when she sees that Lucy has joined the Communist Party, she accuses her of just jumping from one cause to another. Um, and then he, I also have a flyer here for the celebration of Lucy's uh, 82nd birthday um, at the Midland Hotel. And, but she is very dispirited. You know, the revolution is that she had been hoping for has not happened. And so she says here, oh misery, I, drank, I have drunk thy cup of sorrow to its dregs, but I am still a rebel. So she's unvowed. 
And then just here's a picture from Bug House Square. This is the kind of um, speakers that you would see people standing on buckets or soap boxes. And then this was the door to the uh, pickle club. And it says on the door, step high, stoop low, and leave your dignity outside. <laughs> Man, I would have loved to have gone. Um, in 1941 is one of Lucy's last public appearances. And it's very ironic that it's the International Harvester Fact factory because it was a successor to the McCormick Reaper plant. So if we remember way back to the events at the Haymarket, that was what that was the event that spurred the meeting at the Haymarket. So it's a weird sad circle that one of her last public events was at that site. Um, on March 7th of 1942, her house catches on fire. And again, Lucy has lost her sight. It's quite possible that she couldn't see her way to get out of the house. Uh, George Markstall is outside and he sees that the house is on fire. He rushes in to save Lucy. Uh, he dies the next day of injuries sustained in the fire. Again, it's very ironic that Lucy dies in a fire when you think about a lot of the language that they use to describe Lucy in the paper. The, her daily diet is red fire, eyes flashing with revolutionary fire and zeal. She's inflammatory, she's bombastic, she's a firebrand. So it's, it's sadly ironic that it was a fire that took her life. Um, she's buried in Forest Park near the Haymarket Monument. When they went into the house, uh, they found Albert Jr.'s ashes there, so they are buried along with her. Um, she had to ask the Pioneer Aid Society to be buried near the market and the uh, Haymarket Monument because, again, they had sort of a sort of a prickly relationship. In fact, Lucy wanted to uh, will her house to the Pioneer Aid Society, but she didn't want them to sell it. She wanted them to rent it so that the proceeds from the rent would go to the upkeep of the monument. And Irving Abrams, who was the last living uh, member of the Pioneer Aid Society, was like, Lucy, we don't want to be renters. Just will us the house. So they went back and forth. But in the end, her will was declared invalid anyway, and the house was sold for $800. Uh, ben Reitman and Irving Abrams go to Lucy's house after the fire to try to recover some of her library, and they see that at least 1,500 books are missing. They go to the police and they say, where are, where are her books? And they say, we don't know where her books are. Um, but years later, a book that was, had obviously belonged to Lucy shows up for sale, and when they look in that book, they see that it has stamps in it from the Library of Congress and from the FBI. So clearly they had stolen those books. Um, I, we don't know where are they all are. Uh, in uh, March uh, 12, 1942, Ben Reitman speaks at her memorial, and again, it's contentious because the they can't decide who is in charge of the memorial. Is it the anarchists or is it the communists? And so they come up with a compromise so they both speak. And after this memorial service, Ben Reitman says that she was the last of the dinosaurs, that brave group of Chicago anarchists. So Lucy then sort of fades from public you know, if she's remembered at all, it's as the martyr of, as the widow of Albert Parsons. Um, but in 1976, somebody finally writes a um, biography of her, Lucy Parsons, an American Revolutionary, by Carolyn Asbach. And you can go on the Chicago uh, History Museum's website and find, uh, she did a lot of interviews for her book. So you can hear her interviewing Studs Terkel and uh, a couple of people that actually knew Lucy Parsons. In 2004, Lucy Ella Gonzalez Parsons Park is established at Belmont and Kilpatrick. So this is 2004. The Chicago police vehemently oppose this park being named after Lucy Parsons. So she's still rubbing the police department the wrong way, even all these years later. And then Mayor Daly at the time, who clearly doesn't understand who Lucy is, says, well, don't blame the widows for the men. <laughs> In 2017, Lucy Gonzalez Parsons Way is dedicated at Kitsy and Schubert. And another book has come out, and, and again, this is the book that I heavily referenced during this presentation, Goddess of Anarchy by Jacqueline Jones. And then in 2022, there's a housing development in Logan Square with 100% affordable housing units, and it's named Lucy Gonzalez Parsons Apartments. But I wanted to end on, you know, again, Lucy was many things, and she was a very contradictory and controversial. But in the end, she was dedicated to a cause that she very much believed in. And she says, all my life has been devoted to the cause of the downtrodden and the oppressed. I am ready and willing to suffer for my beliefs. I will gladly give my life. All I ask is that our flag of red be draped around me when I die. So I want to acknowledge uh, Mark Rogovin, who 
turned me on to the Haymarket um, Monument and was very instrumental in keeping the memory of all of these radicals alive. Uh, the staff at the Chicago History Museum were amazing because I could not figure out how to work a microfiche. <laughs> Does anybody remember it so long ago? And then if anybody wants my list of references, um, I'm happy to send them to you. So that's it. some people that probably know a lot more than I do. Um, does anybody have any questions or anything you want to bring up? Who is the sculptor of the monument? And is it made out of brass or bronze? It's bronze and it's, uh, uh, I forget the first name, Weinert is the last name. And the, the monument was unveiled in 1893, which was the same year as the um, the uh, Chicago, the Columbia, the, the exhibition here in Chicago, the World's Fair. And so a lot of people actually came out to see the monument as well as go to the fair. And when it was unveiled, it was Albert Parsons Jr. who um, pulled the cord to, uh, you know, drop the cloth. It, um, but it's beautiful. It's a beautiful, have you, everybody needs to go. If you haven't been there, it's beautiful. And there's debate about, so it's, you know, a, a figure, a female figure laying a laurel wreath or a victory wreath on the fallen worker. And if you notice, one hand is open, but the hand behind her is still clutched as though they are fighting on. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty amazing monument. Is it a grand monument? Say that again? Is it granite? I believe it's granite behind, yeah. And then at the bottom um, are the words that August Spies said at the very end, uh, day will come when our voices will be more powerful than the voices you are throttling today, which is pretty prescient when you think about how many people, there's so many people, so many giants in the labor movement that were inspired because of the events at the Haymarket. And so many of them are buried there at, by the monument. So Emma Goldman is there, Lucy is there, Big Bill Haywood is there, um, Ben Reitman is there, Aldrin Declare, there's a ton of people that are very important. <laughs> I was just going to comment that Nina Van Zandt Spies didn't have a gravestone until the last couple of years. And uh, I worked with the Illinois Labor History Society, and we kind of modeled it off of Lucy Parsons. So it's interesting to hear that they were kind of contentious. Yeah. So, yeah, we kind of used the same font and stuff. Oh, so fine. she has a gravestone now. And, and like I said, they made up at the end. In fact, the two of them said, if I die first, will you talk at my <laughs> memorial? So they had a little agreement. Mm -hmm. At the time of the uh, Haymarket massacre, were most of the was most of the labor uh, movement anarchist? No, so it was a mixture. So the the anarchists were definitely the the more radical branch of it. Um, so uh, yeah, I, and, and if somebody else wants to chime in, but the but definitely the anarchist branch was definitely the more radical. In fact, when they were getting the unions on board for the eight hour to all protest to all go for the general strike. Uh, I think they, they, at first the, the anarchists were a little hesitant because it was kind of a low bar. You know, they were like, well, if we don't want it. And in fact, Lucy quite often would be frustrated at progressive um, accomplishments because she thought it was sort of like pablum. If the workers are happy, they're not going to overthrow capitalism. So at first the, at first the anarchists were like, eh, that's too low of a bar. But then when they saw how many people were actually, you know, being, it, inspired by this, then they, in fact, joined and became very involved with it. Mm -hmm. One of your illustrations shows the receiving wall at German Wallhack, and there's another one that shows something similar with a lot more people around it. Do you know where the receiving wall was at German Wallhack? I don't. <laughs> I've asked other people on occasion, and no one seems to know. Yeah, I don't. And, and at one point, I was, and I can't remember, I've read so much stuff, at one point they wanted to move Albert's body and Lucy didn't want them to move Albert's body. So I don't even know what that was about. I'm, I'm assuming that they moved them from that temporary vault to a final resting place and I don't know why they talked about moving them again. Well, you know what a receiving vault was. Right, just, so just temporary. It's where, when you couldn't dig graves in the wintertime, yeah. you had to put them somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially around here. Mm -hmm. uh, when you spoke about uh, Lucy and the suffragist, uh, did you say she was not? Correct. So, but, correct, but because it, uh, it, in, in her way of thinking, voting was pointless. But it, she was, she was with the group. She was not a suffragette. She, she marched with them. She supported them. 
I I mean, there's, a photo, that, there's a photo of her in her white dress. All right, well, and and the margins. there might be some. I did not see that in any of my uh, research. So I would love to, then I'm corrected if that's true. Um, and, but in the in the literature that I read, they said that she did not join this. Maybe she joined them to be there. A person at the Newberry Library showed it to me. So okay, all right, perfect. I will, thank you. I, so I could I, be wrong. <laughs> well, I don't want to say that you're wrong, but yeah. I just like that to, to be known that she was, you know, yeah. she was there. Yeah, and it could be that she was there. And, you know, as we see that Lucy was um, a little, um, I don't want to say mercurial, but, you know, she would show up, she would show up to events. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. so it could, be that, it could be that as well. But I will try to find that before I do this again. And I, you know what, and I'll, I'll, I, I know the guy, and I, if Perfect. I can get in touch with him, I'll. I would love, that would be awesome. Yeah, I did not see that in any of the biographies about her, but. Mm -hmm. uh, this lady sitting next to me has portrayed Lucy Parsons. Aww, uh, <laughs> so you would she's know. She's <laughs> an actress, and she has a whole background about Lucy, and uh, she and I have been to the cemetery several times Aww. on occasions. Yeah. Yeah. So and her name is Alma Washington, Aww. and she's terrific. <laughs> Over the years, put so much together, Aww. and I'm I'm writing a longer play about her, awesome. and uh, I'm just about at the end, and we, you know, trying to solidify it. And I wouldn't have got there without her. Aww. Well, we should have traded places. What am I oh, doing up here? <laughs> Oh saying. my gosh. But yeah, I would love to know more about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I should have said that I did. Oh, yes, and I did that. Uh, you know, Nikki? Yeah. I did a one woman show down at Clark House years ago. Many years ago. Many years when ago. Yeah. Yes. Oh, awesome. But the uh, Illinois Humanities Council, like, you know, they had that traveling. Uh, Rose Scholar thing. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, that so was cool. Good. So cool. Mm -hmm. yeah, I guess it's fun to sort of comment like um, whenever I learn about labor history, <laughs> we often yes. learn, you know, on the one hand, it's like you're sort of turning people into martyrs and heroes and great people, but then you, when you actually learn the details of their life, you see how flawed they were. And how, well, they're human. And then, and then it's like you learn about the infighting that happened back then, and they're like, I'm so glad we no longer have infighting now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it is, it is, it is curious. I mean, they're human, and people are three dimensional, and you know, this is a snapshot. I'm sure this is nothing at all like if Lucy Parsons was actually here. We, you know, again, you can't contain anybody into one neat box. But, uh, and we do, we do want to turn people into martyrs, and we want to turn them into a thing so that we can identify with that and be inspired. Well, thanks everybody. This is awesome. What a great turnout. Thank you.